Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So this is one of the presentations from the Embodiment Conference. So um, I guess many of you know the Embodiment Conference was a huge event over two weeks where over 140 speakers um, led presentations on embodiment. Now, a lot of these were visual. Uh, some of them were more kind of talking based, though. And um, we thought, you know what, we could give some of these away as part of the podcast. Um, so listening to this, you may hear references to um, questions or things in the chat. Uh, we've tried to select ones that they're not demonstrating too much visually obviously um you know if it piques your interest you can always see uh, you can always buy the full package of embodiment conference recordings a bit of an encyclopedia actually uh, embodiment netflix someone was calling it and that is available if you just google the embodiment conference i'm sure you'll you'll be able to find a link to that um, so yeah, this is one of the speakers, and as I say, it's a bit different. Um, it may or may not be me interviewing them, presenting it. It's mostly them just doing their thing, and you know, excuse the sort of occasional references to comments or, or visual demonstrations. And it just seemed like a lot of the speakers were um, extremely kind of high level people, and it's stuff we wanted to make available. So here it is. So, everyone, take a breath. Let me welcome the smartest man in the universe, author of 2,200 books. He communicates with dolphins with his brainwave, one of my personal heroes, a man who's changed my life and many other lives through his epic models of the world, the integral model particularly. Ken Wilbur, you are so welcome. Thank you, my friend. It's a delight to be here. So let me open up with a big question. What is the role of the body in human evolution? Yeah, <laughs> okay, a um, couple of days on, uh, on that answer. Um, well, let me start by saying that one of the things that we try to do with an approach that we call integral is, is to take a truly comprehensive, uh, inclusive uh, framework that really does um, take into account as many authentically legitimate perspectives and viewpoints as possible. So we're not really trying to find what one discipline is the correct way to look at something, but we're really trying to find out how all of them, because they all have some sort of partial truth, how they all actually fit together. So this becomes really obvious if we look at something that seems as simple as the body. And let me start by just giving an example of some of the different types of perspectives that we all have available to us and that different disciplines have actually developed based on these specific perspectives. And so, uh, for example, in virtually every major mature language around the world, there are what are referred to as first, second, and third person pronouns. And these are actually different perspectives. So a first person perspective is defined as the person who is speaking. So right now I would be have a first person perspective. That's an I space or a me, mine space. And that's a particular way of looking at the world. But then there's also the person that I'm talking to. And that's defined as the second person. So we have right now, you would be a second person and you have a perspective. And so your perspective is represented by pronouns in English, like you or thou. And that's a, that's a real perspective. That's an important perspective. And when you and I attempt to understand each other, then that gives us what's often referred to as a first person plural, or a we space. And that we space is different from my I space, and it's different from your space. But we attempt to come together and have some sort of mutual resonance, mutual understanding. And so that's a, another type of perspective. And that, for example, 
Well, I'll finish with the third person and then very briefly review these. But third person is defined as the person or thing being spoken about. So that's something like a him or a her or a them or a they, or just in general, it's an it or an its perspective. Um, each of these have different types of disciplines that have developed based on those perspectives. So we hear things like the good, the true, and the beautiful. Well, those are all different disciplines based on first, second, and third person perspectives. Um, we have um, people like Jürgen Abermas, who some people consider perhaps the world's greatest living philosopher. And he maintains that every time person speaks, they're putting themselves in relationship to three different worlds. And these are indeed an I, we, and it world. And each of those has what he calls a different validity claim. And that means different ways that we find truth in those different perspectives, because they do have different truths. And yet they're all important and they all need to be included. So looking at something in just a third person objective fashion gives us um, a validity claim of just objective truth. It's just atoms come together to form molecules, molecules come together to form cells. Those are all third person objective viewpoints. That's what a large amount of modern science is based on. It's clearly a very important perspective. Then when it comes to a we space and the type of truth we have there, well, one of those is how should you and I as subjects treat each other when we interact? In other words, it's a world of ethics. And that's a different type of truth than the truth of cells are made of molecules, molecules are made of atoms, and so on. So that's the good in terms of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And then in terms of our own subjective space, we have what's true for us, and this can include our ideas of what's aesthetically attractive or beautiful. So in the good, the true, and the beautiful, it's often said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, a first person perspective. It doesn't mean it isn't real. It means it's real from a first person perspective. So we do have those different types of truth and the body means something different in each of those. And that's part of the problem. So one of the most commonly used differences in terms of the body is between a first person view of what the body is and that's my own immediate direct feeling. It's how I relate to my body. And that's a subjective reality. And it's not something that I have to decide by talking ethically with you. Or it's not something that I decide by looking at my tissues or organs or cellular systems. It's what I decide introspecting my own first person eye space. And that's a very, very real reality. And it tends to be the reality that is stressed in things like body work or body therapy or any of those types of um, self-improvement programs or anything like that. And those are very real realities. <clears throat> those tend to grow and develop. And I'll go through that in a minute because I think that's one of the main things that you're talking about and that you wanted to address. But then there's also, we can look at the body in just a third person objective scientific stance. And here we tend to look at the organism as a whole and we treat it as all of its different parts, including its brain, as just a third person objective reality. So here there doesn't seem to be, for example, a split between mind and body. Because here, if we're looking at the organism just at, in, as a third person unity, then the brain is equally a part of that organism, just like the heart or the lungs or the bones are. So we don't find this dualism between mind and body when we're looking at it just in a third person perspective. That problem doesn't exist. And so a lot of people who talk about embodiment will sit, are looking at it from just that third person perspective. So they're really talking about the total organism 
and so then they'll say things like, well, there is no problem between a mind-body split. That's, that's, not, that's just an illusion. It's not really real. From a third-person perspective, that's right. But from a first-person perspective, that's not right. From a first-person perspective, there is a felt difference between the mind and the body. And the relationship between what's felt as my mental awareness and my bodily, fleshy feeling awareness, the relationship of those actually grows and develops. And what many people who work on embodiment as a type of therapeutic issue or an issue of personal growth and development, what they're working on is how to relate to that felt body. And sometimes they'll slip into talking about that in third person. And so they'll say, well, these are actually a, 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 a integrated, unified, single being, and our job is to feel that total unity and not to split it into mind and body or something like that. But here, what, if, if you take that too absolutistically, then what you end up doing is reducing the mind to the brain. And that's a category mistake. That's a confusion of perspectives. The brain is a third person objective reality. You can see it, you can see it as an object. If you cut somebody's skull open and look, you can actually see the thing. It looks like a crumpled grapefruit. Your mind doesn't look like a crumpled grapefruit at all. It doesn't feel like a crumpled grapefruit. It doesn't act like a crumpled grapefruit. It doesn't have neurophysiological transmitters like serotonin and acetylcholine and dopamine running through it. The brain does, and those are third-person objective realities, and those are real. But the mind and body are first-person interior feelings, and that's different. So we have to be careful if we just sort of blithely say mind and body are one, because when it comes to that interior first person perspective, as I said, the relation between mind and body actually grow and develop. And the relationship is different at every major stage of development. And so that becomes an important part of understanding for people that are helping somebody become, let's say, embodied. So what in, to be embodied means is a largely first person perspective reality because the organism looked at in just a third person it's already a unity the brain isn't split from the rest of the organism right, without some sort of horrifying illness i mean it's already a, a single unified organism it's born that way stays that way is always a unified integrated organism and if it isn't it dies so that's not the issue. If you're trying to say, I want to be embodied, it implies that, well, I can be in a state where I'm not embodied. I'm out of touch with my body. And that doesn't mean the brain is out of touch with the lungs. It's not a third person statement. It's a first person statement. It's a relation of your I-ness to what you call your felt body. And you can be out of touch with that. What you call yourself can be dissociated or alienated or out of touch with the felt body. And generally speaking, that's not a good thing. Generally speaking, that's something you want to try to overcome. That's where things like shadow elements and uh, doing shadow work can help you get in touch with those aspects of your body that you've dissociated or split off or repressed or disowned. And those are very legitimate techniques. They are relatively effective. They do work. There are several different types of techniques that have developed over the years to get the mind and body in touch with each other and integrated. And only recently did we understand the developmental components of that. And so if you want, I can just go ahead and give you about like a five minute summary of that developmental process of how mind and body are related to self. Should we do that? Yeah, go for it, Kim. Okay. <laughs> when the child is born, the infant is born, it initially really can't tell where its body 
stops and a chair starts or the floor starts or the environment starts. It's in what's called an oceanic fusion state. And it physically can't distinguish between what's body and what's not body. Starting at around four months in a, in a stage that Margaret Mahler calls the hatching process, the infant learns to differentiate its body from the environment. And so it can tell when it bites its thumb, it hurts. When it bites a blanket, it doesn't. There's a difference. Now at this stage, the mind is very poorly developed. The self is very poorly developed. And the infant doesn't have a body. The infant simply is a body. And for the next several stages, that's its fundamental identity. It just simply is a bodily felt sense. It doesn't have very much of a mind. It doesn't have a capacity for concepts or logic or any of that. And itself as a self-reflective individual entity doesn't exist yet either. So for these first around three stages or so, the, 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 Infant simply is a body. It doesn't have a body. It just is a body. Now, the thing about the body is by itself, it can't take the role of other. So when you're feeling just your body feelings, you can't feel what somebody else's body feelings are. The only way you can get a sense of what another person is, how they're seeing the world, is you have to do that mentally. You have to have a fairly well-formed mind, and it can take the perspective of your mind, and then I can start to get a sense of how you're looking at the world. That's a mental capacity. That's not a felt bodily capacity. Now, of course, if you slide over and just look at it in third person, then you'll say, oh, well, that's something the brain's doing. The brain is part of the organism, so it's actually a whole unity. I say, right, that's third person. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about first person. So what starts to happen, well, you, you can see an example of this if you take a, a young child who's at one of those early stages and you take a ball that's colored green on one side and red on the other and you put the ball between you and the child and then you spin it several times so the child can see that one half is red, the other half is green. Then put the ball so the red half is facing the child, the green half is facing you. Ask the child, what color are you seeing? Of course, they're looking at red. So you ask them, what color are you seeing? They'll say red. And then you say, what color am I seeing? They'll say red. They don't get that you're seeing green. They can't put themselves in your perspective. That's the body per se. That's its stance. It can't take the role of other. So part of the problem with embodiment becomes as the mind starts to emerge, which it does in the next stage, how can we then track how the mind and the body are fitting together? Because that's where we can start to get some real differences, some real inner conflict, some real dissociation, alienation, repression. That's where problems start. So the next stage, um, and we generally refer to these stages, there are many different names for them. We'll often use colors. Um, the next stage uh, um, we refer to as amber. It's sometimes called the conformist stage. The point is that the mind has started to emerge and that mind can take the role of other. So starting at that stage, you actually are having a mind emerge that's different from the body. It feels different. The mind can take the role of other. So at that stage, if you ask the child, what color am I seeing when they're looking at red and I'm looking at green, they'll correctly say they're seeing red, but they'll also correctly say I'm seeing green. So that means they can now take my viewpoint They've expanded into a second person perspective. So now they also have to start thinking about how they will fit as a role into other people. And they understand that there are now people that have perspectives that are different from theirs. And so different people have different roles. So how am I going to fit into this? There also starts to be a problem of 
how is this mind that's taking perspectives, how does that fit with this whole bodily sense of feelings and emotions and sensations? Because these are starting to have different characteristics. And because of that, technically, on a healthy sense, they're just differentiating. And then they'll subsequently integrate. And that integration is the point that we especially are interested in, because that's what a true embodiment means. But first we have to differentiate mind and body before we can integrate them. And so that's the process that's occurring here. So we have a mind start to develop. It can take the role of other. One of the things that happens with that is that initially, as it's taking the role of other, it gets stuck in the role of other. So in other words, it ends up being very, very conformist. And this stage is actually often called, Jane Lovinger, for example, actually calls it the conformist stage. Other names that are given to it are things like my country right or wrong or law and order. Um, the whole point is the mind is taking the role of other, but it's getting stuck in that. It can't think for itself. It can't take its own role or its own viewpoint. And it is starting to separate from the body, starting to differentiate from the body. And this is a really crucial period because if something goes wrong developmentally in those earlier stages, when the self is just beginning to occur and there's starting to be a differentiation between self and other, if something goes wrong there, that's extremely serious. And most developmentalists will point to things like borderline disorders, because the problem there is not so much repression. It's not that the mind is impressing the body. That happens next. Here, it's that the boundary between itself, um, the boundary of the self, is poorly formed or misformed or malformed. And that's a very, very serious problem. So, but if, if you negotiate that relatively healthfully, then the mind starts to differentiate and emerge. Now the mind can start repressing the body. And again, we're talking about these as first person realities. So the body doesn't mean an organic objective set of tissues and nerves and blood vessels and all that. It means your own felt senses, your own sensations, your own emotions, uh, your own feelings. The whole sort of Freudian breakthrough is that the mind can repress those bodily sensations and those bodily desires and those bodily impulses. And that repression seals them out of awareness, cuts off that part of the body from your own awareness, but it doesn't just go away because of that, because it's still there, it's still active, but you're forcing it out of awareness. And that creates a whole series of emotional problems. Um, the original Freudians actually invented a term neurosis for that kind of problem. And it's a real problem. It's, it's very serious. Almost everybody has some degree of that problem. And the stuff that's repressed or pushed out of awareness is often referred to as shadow material. And so we get the whole beginning of shadow work as a type of important therapy that almost everybody can benefit from. Uh, and we should at least, uh, if we're trying to become our own better selves, live up to our own potential, we want to at least be open to, to keeping an eye out for our own shadow material. What are those things in ourself that we refuse to acknowledge? What are those things about ourselves that we just don't want to face? What are those things about ourselves that we actually lie about to ourselves. That's a serious problem. Um, Sir Carl Jung used to say, for example, that the road to the self lies through the shadow. It's certainly an important area. And when we also consider that most of the shadow consists of what we're calling bodily sensations, bodily feelings, bodily desires, then you're seeing a mind repress the body because they've now differentiated and because they're two different things, the mind can step on the body and, in a sense, crush it. 
So what continues in terms of that differentiation is the self, which has started to emerge and began by identifying strictly with the body, as the mind starts to emerge, the self disidentifies with the body and identifies with the mind. So now the self doesn't have a mind, the self is a mind and it has a body. And this is the beginning of a mind, body, possible separation and alienation. And that is a very, very serious issue because when you just dissociate the body in general, you're not just pushing a single shadow element out of awareness. You're clamping down on, on, on the entire body's elan vital, the body's energy, the body's feeling, the body's full awareness of, of its immediate environment. The body is a core part of what you are and you're sealing that off. This can continue and get worse with the emergence of the next stage, which we call orange, and many developmentalists refer to it as an actual emergence of a stage of rationality. We can actually form um, reasonable ideas. And you can think in like hypothetical deductive ways. You can consider what if statements and as if statements. Piaget defines this stage as essentially similar to the Aristotelian systems of logic. This is where you start to get the possibility of a major dissociation between mind and body because the mind does seem to be running so far ahead of the body's immediate feelings. Again, among other things, the body in general isn't aware of a past and it isn't aware of a future. It can't take the role of other, but it is an absolutely rich, direct, immediate source of organic vitality and living energy and elan vital. Because the mind is starting to develop these extraordinary capacities, we do start to get this mind-body dualism. And particularly in civilizations where, that have developed to that point, modern West, typical example, this becomes a serious philosophical question. What is the relation of mind and body? And that becomes a serious issue because you really can dissociate the whole bodily feeling itself, as we were saying, not just some particular libido desire or some particular impulse or some sexual drive or some bit of uh, anger or something like that. You can just start to dissociate the body itself. In particular, as the mind becomes aware of the reality that it's in, it starts to realize things like it's finite, it's mortal, it's open to death and decay. Um, Jung said life itself is, is um, uh, a terrible illness with a horrible prognosis. It lingers for years and ends in death. So all of a sudden you have people like the existentialists coming along and saying one of the problems that the mind does is it doesn't just repress the body, it lies about its own mortality. It creates immortality projects. It creates fantasies about living forever. Everything that it undertakes from building pyramids to creating works of art are ways to avoid death and essentially avoid bodily life. Body is bad. Um, we have, well, we'll talk real briefly at the next point about the spiritual components of this and what we call waking up. But notice that in a lot of the early religions, the body itself was looked at as the source of all suffering, of all original sin. In Theravada Buddhism, it's inherently marked with dukkha or suffering. That's what samsara is. And it's marked by bodily being. So, so the body is starting to get a very nasty reputation here. And certainly it's being looked upon as a lesser reality. And this dualism, this mind-body dualism, 
became a real mark of things like modern Western civilization. So as we then start to, to continue growth and development, and by the way, each of these stages of development are simply getting more unified, more complex, and more whole. They're trying to include more and more and more things. And one of the ways they do that is differentiate and then integrate, then differentiate, then integrate. Just like if you're looking at a, at a, um, a, a fetus cell, it starts out as one cell, divides into four cells, that divides into eight, that divides into 16, into 32. Pretty soon all of those divisions start organizing into tissue systems. So they differentiate and then integrate the higher order. And those tissue systems come together into organs. Those organs come together into whole organisms. So that seems to be the general movement of this developmental sequence. So we're tracking how mind and body differentiate in relation to the self. And they also then become integrated. And what we're doing right now is starting to, to move through the period where they've dramatically differentiated, and in some cases dissociated, gone too far, and actually split. Now, though, we're going to see them start to come together at even higher stages of development. And one of the first moves is the move to a stage that many developmentalists would consider, well, the way the previous orange stage of rationality was, in a sense, the basis of modernity, the next stage, which was a stage of pluralism and multiculturalism and supersensitivity, that became the basis of post-modernity. And that was the revolution of the 60s. And what we find at that stage of development is that we're starting to now disidentify the self from the mind. So we started out the self was just identified with the body. Then the mind started to emerge, the self identified with the mind, disidentified with the body. So it was a mind, it had a body. Now it's getting to the point where after that differentiation became quite pronounced, now the self is starting to differentiate from the mind on the way to integrating mind and body. So this is the first step in that direction, but it doesn't get there completely. What it does start to do is take up an almost anti-mind stance. So this green or multicultural or pluralistic stage doesn't like intellectual ideas. It tends to be sort of very anti-intellectual, but it likes feelings. So it's, it's trying to befriend the body that has been dissociated. So it becomes very important to, let's say, come from the heart or be in touch with your feelings, or be in touch with your body. And that's what this stage does. It doesn't actually succeed, but it's a very high ideal. And a lot of people that are talking about embodiment are at this stage. That's not good or bad. These stages just keep unfolding. But it happens to be that at that stage, you first start to get a conscious desire for embodiment precisely because you've realized the previous stage or two has pushed the body away, has disidentified with it, has split it off, and that's caused a problem. So you get this green postmodern come from the heart, trust feelings, don't like intellectualism, don't like abstract thinking, don't like analytical thinking, all of that. That in itself is a move towards this more integrated state. That integrated state tends to happen at the next major stage of development. That stage of development is so profound that almost every developmentalist who studied this has come up with some sort of term to help distinguish this new stage from all of the previous stages. So Claire Graves, for example, who studied values, called all the previous stages first tier and then called these new stages second tier. Abraham Maslow called all those earlier stages deficiency needs because they were driven by lack. You lack something, you need it. These new stages he called being needs. B 
because you are motivated by an overflowing abundance, not a lack of something, but an overflowing abundance. And one of the reasons you have that overflowing abundance is because you're back in touch with the body in a very profound way. But here's specifically the way that plays out. The developmentalists that study that stage have found the way it's most often summarized is mind and body are both experiences of an integrated self. So what's happened is we've gone from identifying with the body to then disidentifying the body and identifying with the mind. Then we started disidentifying with the mind. And now the self is not stuck in either one, but it's fully experiencing both of them. But it's also transcending them. The self is experiencing both mind and body. And the self is described as integrated. And so most all of these second tier stages have terms like integrated, integral, um, systemic, that kind of thing. This represents embodiment as the very highest stage in these developmental sequences that we're aware of yet. So that's a type of embodiment where you are not just identified with the body, but you're fully in touch with it. Nor are you just identified with the mind, but you're fully in touch with that. What you are doing is now integrating them and having a full access to both. So you can see how this notion of embodiment switches from stage to stage to stage to stage. And you can see some that would sound like they're really embodied, like those earliest stages in childhood when the self is just nothing but a body. That can sound really embodied, but it, it's not really embodied in any high sense. Um, then we have a separation from the body, then a separation from the mind, and then an integration of them both. That's a very, very high developmental stage, by the way. And only around, and this can sometimes upset people, but it's just an objective piece of research, but only around 5% of the average population reaches that stage of embodiment. So what that does mean is that that can become part of a therapeutic goal or aim, which is what are the things that we can do to help people develop to that truly embodied state that's actually integrated and not dissociated or not merely identified with. So that would be a quick rundown of embodiment through the developmental stages of growing up. Developmental stage, second tier, breakthrough into new stage of consciousness, new step in evolution, what happens now? Well, that's what's so interesting, is that this whole second tier integrative stage is so radically new that we literally have never had anything like that in our past history. Now, there have been highly advanced individuals who have uh, reached some of these stages, but on a large scale, um, this is radically new. And human beings have gone through these, you know, five or six major transformations. They were all in first tier. We've never, ever had a transformation that went from one tier to another tier. We don't know how to do it. We have no precedent for it, even though it's, it's sort of the repository of enormous number of good things. If you track love, for example, these stages are the most inclusive in terms of their capacity for love and care and concern. If you look at true inclusivity, these stages are the first that truly are inclusive in their orientation. And in part, it's because they are integrating the organic body. But one of the definitions of every stage at first tier is that it thinks that its truth and values are the only real truth and values in existence. But all of a sudden, at second tier, the stages there start saying, no, wait a minute. Every previous stage is important. They all need to be included. If nothing else, they're all stages in an overall human growth and development. We can't cut any of them out. It's like we go from atoms to molecules to cells to organisms. 
we can't get from atoms to cells and skip molecules. So all of a sudden you have these incredibly encompassing, integrated, inclusive stages of development. That's a cultural transformation, the likes of which we have never seen. And it appears that we get these major transformations occurring when whatever that leading edge is, and right now it's just the beginning of second tier, whenever that reaches about 10% of the population, then those values tend to kind of seep through the whole culture and we get a kind of cultural transformation. So that's what happened when we went from um, an amber conformist into Western uh, rational enlightenment and the birth of modern science. And by the way, it was at that stage that we also outlawed slavery for the first time in all of history. And then the 60s had this whole um, green revolution of postmodernism, pluralism, environmental care, civic, civil rights, and so on. But now we're getting to where the leading edge is starting to be the second tier. Again, about 5% of the population is here right now. Evidence is when that gets to 10%, we're going to see another type of tipping point and there'll be another kind of shift in our cultural background. What's interesting is that if you run projections based on research right now, it looks like that 5% will become 10% in somewhere between perhaps 10 to 20 years. But that's also right about the time that we're due to hit that technological singularity. So this would amount to a singularity in our external third person technological realities, along with what amounts to a singularity in our interior cultural and consciousness states. Second tier is the equivalent of a singularity. It's a radically new and unbelievably revolutionary, evolutionary change of consciousness and culture. To have both of these occurring together at the same time is going to be simply unimaginable at this time. So we have that to look forward to. And a part of that is our embodied um, um, existence because we truly are integral or inclusive in all the dimensions of our being. And that includes the organic body as an absolutely crucial component, particularly the component that gives us this organic presence, this um, elan vital, this vitality, this um, inherent joy in living. And these are incredibly important components of a human being. And they, for the past couple stages, as we've seen, have been left out. And so embodiment is an important part of that, uh, that coming, coming reality. So in terms of embodiment practitioners, Ken, like what, what's helpful in, in terms of moving this evolution along? Right. Um, one of the ways, one of the questions was, how can you sort of, what are some of the characteristics of somebody who's actually at second tier? How can you tell somebody who's at second tier? One of the ways, it's just, it's uh, a subjective response. Um, but we are working with first person realities, so that's okay. Um, but the person will tend to have, um, they'll kind of radiate an authenticity. They'll radiate a kind of uh, vitality and a certain presence, a capacity to inhabit the present moment fully and to be consistently present and available and open and transparent because they're not pushing anything out of their awareness or their identity. So they have this extraordinary openness and this extraordinary, um, it looks almost like a freedom and an ease that they have in their being. It's very interesting. If you take like four or five people and four of them are from first tier and one of them is from second tier and you put them in a room together and let them talk for two, three, four hours and then you interview them on which of the people did you like and which of the people did you dislike. Most of the first tier people will find things to say that they didn't like about other first tier people because they have different values, different views, and they disagree with them. So they have a little bit of problem with them. 
almost nobody can think of something negative to say about somebody at second tier because the person at second tier can relate to all of them. Claire Graves, who's one of the pioneers in this, actually called second tier by the phrase universal donor, which, which is a good phrase. In blood, as you know, there's a certain blood type that can donate to every other blood type. And that's what second tier can do with almost any of the first tier stages. They can relate to them because they include all of them in their own being. And that's an extraordinary state to have. And people can feel it. They resonate that. And so it tends to be a very sort of attractive state of being. And in terms of practices that you want to do, it's a combination of learning to both disidentify and embrace. So one of the phrases we use is transcend and include. So every major stage of development tends to do that. And we see this especially happen with second tier. So even an atom goes to a molecule, the molecule transcends the atom. It goes beyond what the atom does, but it also embraces it or includes it. And then a cell goes beyond what a molecule can do. It transcends it, but it also actually embraces a molecule. It actually enwraps it and includes it. And that's what happens in terms of body and mind. You're transcending them, meaning you're not stuck in just one or the other. You're no longer just a body and you're no longer just a mind. You're an integrated self experiencing both of those. So you've transcended them, but you're also embracing them. You're also including them. And so sometimes it's almost paradoxical in terms of practices. Some practices can just be exercising the body, doing just things like um, physical hatha yoga work, for example. Um, in ways of developing the mind, there are several different uh, courses, practices, techniques you can take to help develop your mental capacities. But at the same time, you also want to be letting go of any strict identity with those. And that's where certain spiritual practices start to come into play. And those, very briefly, is that the main theme of the world's great paths of enlightenment or awakening or metamorphosis or moksha is that human beings don't just have this separate self that's identified with just this organism or just this individual mind and individual body. They also have a deeper identity that's literally one with everything that's arising. It's one with the entire universe. It's one with the ground of all being. And the discovery of that ultimate ground of being as your own, what the Sufis call supreme identity, your own truest self. That's universally referred to as something like enlightenment or awakening or waking up or moksha, satori, and so on. And what that is, has a sort of two-part movement to it. The first part is learning to simply witness everything that's arising. And so you witness what's arising and you disidentify with it. So you literally go things like, I see that mountain, but I'm not that mountain. I have sensations, but I'm not those sensations. I have feelings, but I'm not those feelings. I have thoughts, but I'm not those thoughts. I'm just a pure witness of all of that. I'm identified with none of it. And so that pure witnessing awareness, if that's experience in its own direct, immediate way, it's felt as an enormous freedom from being restricted to an identity with just any one of these small things. You're no longer just a body or just a mind or just a separate egoic self. You're literally one with the ground of all being. And that has an enormous sense of freedom, an enormous sense of, of almost blissful release from being identified with any of just these separate individual things that are arising. And so in Sanskrit, it's referred to as nete, nete. I'm not this, I'm not that. It's just a pure sense of I amness, but not I am this person or I am that person or I am a doctor or I am a waitress, just the pure sense of I amness right now. That has a disidentifying effect with everything that's arising. And so in that sense, you're transcending 
your identity with any of those individual components. Now you can take that state very, very deeply. The, the claim in Buddhism, for example, is that that state of awareness, which is known as nirvana, is completely separate from the state of samsara. The entire manifest world, your mind, your body, the mountains, clouds, trees, world, all of that is samsara. You're the pure, empty witness of it all. You're nirvana. And if you really push in to that pure witness, the entire manifest world will even cease to arise in your awareness. Very similar to deep, dreamless sleep. The claim is that that state is without pain, without suffering, without desire, without any sort of harm or hurt. And that's a very real state you can get into. You can train to get into that. We saw this with the Vietnamese monks during the war. When they were protesting the war, they would get into their lotus position, then get into that state of pure cessation or pure nirvana, have their entire bodies doused in gasoline and set on fire. And right on live TV in front of millions of people, they burned to the ground in ashes and didn't even flinch once. That state is real. That is a pure nete nete. I'm not this, I'm not that. And so I'm free of all of that. That's why that kind of enlightenment is referred to as the great liberation. You're free of all suffering, all pain, all desire, all ego. That's a very real state. There was a huge movement in Mahayana Buddhism founded by a gentleman named Nagarjuna. And most forms of Buddhism today actually come from Nagarjuna, not from the original Gautama Buddha, because Nagarjuna spends all of his time attacking original Buddhism. And what he points out is that it's not that nirvana isn't real. That's a real state. You can get into it. But it's not the most real state. There's a state that's even deeper and more real. And that's the state where nirvana isn't just separate from samsara. There's a deeper unity that unites nirvana and samsara. So as the Heart Sutra would put it, that which is emptiness, nirvana, is not other than form, samsara. And that which is form is not other than emptiness. In other words, nirvana and samsara are not two. And you can be in that state of nirvana and still have the entire manifest world arise. And you are one with all of it. So you've gone from being, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not the mountain, I'm not the tree, I'm not this, I'm not that, to I'm actually one with this. I'm one with that. I'm one with everything that's arising. And that tends to have an emotional sense of pure love, because love is this sense of being one with something so entirely that you feel almost a, a, a unity with it. So if you're looking at that and you combine that higher state of waking up with the highest state that we're aware of, of growing up, then you arise in, in relation to the body. You arrive at a state that would say, I'm now one with the body, but I'm not one with just the body. I'm one with everything else that's arising. But this does include the body. So the body is part of a wholeness that I'm now one with. And that can happen only at those higher stages of growing up, where mind and body are both experiences of an integrated self, combined with high stages of waking up, where there's a oneness with everything. And so again, you've both transcended and included. But now there's this oneness that pervades absolutely everything. This is sometimes called ultimate unity consciousness or divine oneness or something like that. But at the very least, these two are relatively independent and you can pursue one without the other. So you can get to a growing up stage, second tier, where mind and body are both experiences of an integrated self. And you might never have had a Satori experience in your entire life. You might never have had a mystical experience or a waking up experience or anything like that. And that's just fine. But alarmingly, you can be at a very high waking up state and still be at a very low state of growing up. And that's a problem. And as a matter of fact, we've never had a spiritual system 
anywhere in the world that included both of those ever. They're one or the other. None of them have been aware of the stages of both and the importance of both. So a truly exciting, truly revolutionary approach to embodiment is to include the embodiment you get from a full growing up with the embodiment you get with the real waking up. That's full embodiment as far as we can tell. And there doesn't seem to be any fuller embodiment than just that. So, Boom. Ken, love the passion in your voice there. Love to hear you come alive. Okay, so Ken, I want to cause some trouble now. And, um, you know, that's what I do best. And this stuff's playing out in culture in interesting ways. Like the attitude to the body has really shifted in culture in the last yeah. even two years, I would say. So I'd love to hear you take this kind of philosophical approach and like, like what's going on in the world today with this stuff. Part of the main difficulty that we have is that because these first tier stages don't really get along well with each other, and because so far we've actually only evolved up to, to about the highest of first tier, then the, the three most recent stages, which are amber, they tend to be ethnocentric, fundamentalist approaches, because again, they just identifying with a specific group, not with all groups, but just the group that's special. Um, it, it can be your family, your clan, your tribe, but it's often your political party, or it's often your fundamentalist religion. And that's what's true. Everybody else is wrong. Then you move up to this orange, modern, world-centric stage, the stage that did manage to get rid of slavery, the stage that introduced universal rights and, and, and introduced a political philosophy known as liberalism, which maintained that the most sovereign entity in any society is the individual itself and its universal rights. In the previous stages, you would talk about the rights of being a Christian, for example. So if you were a Christian, then you get to live forever uh, in the right hand of God in some sort of mythic heaven or whatnot. Um, and if you weren't a Christian, then you were going to burn in hell forever. With the rise of the modern enlightenment, it was no longer okay, you have rights because you're a Christian and, and you don't have rights if you're not. It was you, everybody has equal rights just by virtue of the fact that they're human beings. And so that was an enormous change. It did create this whole philosophy of liberalism. And then in the 60s, when green arose and we got the whole postmodern movement, postmodernism didn't really like the modern liberal stance because it tended to think more in terms of group identity and group politics, didn't really like individual rights, didn't really like free speech, for example. And so it doesn't really support free speech. The original liberal position supports free speech enormously. But these three value structures, often known as traditional, modern, and postmodern, they're at each other's throats. They don't like each other, and they're getting viciously polarized, probably more polarized as factions than any time in American history. And this is really starting to disturb people. I mean, there are very sober social commentators saying, if this gets worse, we really are headed towards a possibly real civil war. Now, the one crucial point to remember with all of that particularly if you're looking at developmental scales, is that the only stage that has the capacity to actually integrate or include those is second tier, because it's the one, by definition, that can see value in all of them. First tier, by definition, can't do that. So as long as we're stuck in first tier, we're stuck with the culture wars, and that is disastrous. So we want to get to second tier, we want to get to a full embodiment, and we want that integrated with mind via the integrated self. That's going to be part of the type of consciousness in culture that if anything can end the culture wars, it's going to have to involve that to some extent. 
simply because that's the only stage of consciousness that accepts all of those different points of view and can fully embrace them in a genuine inclusivity and include a diversity in a real inclusiveness, not just in diversity actually playing one tribe against other tribes and continuing the culture wars. So that's an important part and it's one of the true meanings of embodiment and what embodiment has to do with that cure of the culture wars. Yeah, it's getting pretty nasty right now. You know, we did Brexit, Trump, all the rest of it. And I think there's real concern. I've heard the whole embodiment community say, guys, we need to get it together. There's serious shit going down. And, you know, as you said, this feels like a civil war out there right now. The, the yeah. conference has had attacks from the sort of green side of things pretty heavily, a little bit from the blue, a little bit from the orange, mostly from the green side, if I'm honest, though. Yeah. And, um, you know, it got nasty at a couple of points. And, um, We've, we've been learning as a conference like how to skillfully manage that and talk to these different concerns, and it's uh, right. not easy. And one of the, one of the difficulties, um, a couple of people have brought up what we call a pre-trans or pre-post fallacy, and part of the difficulty whenever we're looking at something like embodiment is we've seen that there are stages that look like you know, they really are embodied, like those very earliest stages where the self is nothing but a body. That really looks like embodiment in an ideal sense. But as we saw, it's not. I mean, it can't even take the role of other. So you have to make sure that you don't confuse those sorts of pre-integrated states with states that truly are integrated. And one of the biggest distinctions right now, sort of the last places that that confusion is occurring, is between green, postmodern, egalitarianism, that because it's trying to get over mind and get back to integrating body, but isn't quite there, it does disidentify with mind, it is anti-intellectual, but it elevates the body to a status that it doesn't yet have. It's not really yet integrated in a real sense. And so it just comes down in terms of, like I said, you always have to be coming from the heart. Your feelings have to come first. If you say anything academic or intellectual, oh, you're not being authentic. You're avoiding your true feelings and all of that. That's not the highest stage of embodiment. And it's certainly not an integrated stage of embodiment and it gets confused because it sounds like it because it sounds like it's saying okay we're putting the body back on stage actually you're elevating the body to a status it doesn't yet have you really need to be a second tier for that body to be actually integrated with the mind so you're not just anti-mind and pro-body you're fully embracing both mind and body and you're doing it actually from an integrated self that's identified exclusively with neither body nor mind, but has an integrated stance embracing both of them equally. That's what's required to get us into that new second stage cure for culture wars and not more green body elevationism. That's a bit of a confusion. So there's, there's a body elevationism at Green, but the other thing I see is a body denial. Like everything's socially constructed, there's no biology, and you know anything can be defined subjectively as well. Well, that's part of the problem, and what that really comes down to is because there is no objective truth according to the postmodern Green stance. And that, by the way, itself is a performative contradiction. I mean, self-contradictory. What it's saying is. It's absolutely universally true that there is no universal truth. Um, and so if that's the case, then there's no reason to believe what they're saying at all. If they're saying there is no truth, then there's no reason to think what they're saying is, is true. So, and they themselves realized this, and that's why it ended up crashing into a nihilism and a narcissism. And technically, yes, that nihilism says, no, science is not real. There's no objective fact. It's nothing but social construction. And then it rests in its own narcissistic desires. Those are the only things that are real. In a sense, that's a regression to the self just being the body and whatever it wants without having to take the role of other or engage in dialogue. 
most of the really aggressive, active postmodernists think that they don't even need to talk to alternative views because they're absolutely convinced that what they're saying is right, even though they can't state what they believe without contradicting themselves. So it's a real mess. And one of the real problems with culture wars right now is that the most progressive thinkers, most of them, are at the, that higher stage of development. So they are at green, and they are making those massive confusions. And that's the problem. That's why green, as a leading edge, has become so problematic. And it's actually causing almost more problems than it's solving. And the only way we're going to get over that is to start moving into second tier. So I don't think we've hit peak stupid yet with green. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't think we've hit the peak green at the peak of its power. And that fucking terrifies me. Like this kind of postmodern wave of it's all relative except for this. And this very strange view of the body that comes with that. And a yep. closing down of many of the sort of values of Western civilization. Right. Like, like, are we going to get through that? Give me some hope, Ken. Oh, I wish I could. I am not born pessimist, really. Um, but it's, it's, it's looking like a horse race um, because there's no simple way that you can get across the problems with postmodernism. I mean, it won't fit on you know, just a single T-shirt. I mean, you can put things like diversity is our strength, and that sounds good. So you can get that on a bumper sticker or a T-shirt. Um, we want inclusivity. Also sounds good. That'll go on a T-shirt. Green can do that kind of stuff. But if you actually get into it and say, okay, wait, wait a minute. What do you mean by diversity? What do you mean by inclusivity? And whatever, what, what they say, you'll realize, is actually not diverse. Because they believe, even though they say they believe in diversity, they believe that their view of that is the only correct view you can have. So they actually don't believe in diversity. In terms of inclusivity, they don't include views that disagree with theirs. They don't even think they have to talk to them. So they're not really inclusive. They say they are, they want to be, but they can't be until they make it all the way to second tier. Green is sort of an awkward halfway step on the way to second tier because it is the you know, next highest stage, but it isn't there. It does have all of these sort of half-truths and those really are calamitous. And it's, it is getting worse. It's hard to say if Green is going to have enough intelligence to self-correct or if we really are gonna to have to wait until second tier simply comes in and sort of over floods them. It's not clear right now. And certainly in terms of like the Democratic Party, it's rushing into this postmodern nihilistic narcissism and group identity egalitarianism as fast as it can. And that is just truly problematic. Not that the right is doing any better, but the left, we used to take it as sort of the leader of a, a genuinely progressive orientation. It was the left that brought us the world-centric universal rights of human beings that brought us liberalism, that ended slavery. That's what we knew the left for. And then all of a sudden in the 60s, part of the left bumped up to that green, multicultural, egalitarian, social constructivism, group identity. It absolutely fell apart and is now just a shambles in terms of philosophy. No serious philosopher believes in postmodernism. It's been criticized right down into nothing but shreds. But because that is a stage of development and about 20 to 25% of the population are at that stage, that's what's determining their thinking. And you can't just talk somebody out of the stage of development they're at. That's the problem. They have to grow and develop through it. So is that gonna happen in time or not? We don't know. I think it's up for grabs right now, Ken, and that's why it's fun to be in the fight, you know, to be in the game. And because it is all up for grabs right now in a way that I haven't seen, even from a few years ago. And I guess what I'm seeing in green, which is a real sign for hope, is one, they're obnoxious. So people go, yuck. 
And the second thing is they're losers. There's a real sense they're just not very effective. They'll keep losing elections. I see green people just being broke all the time and just losing you know, romantically, financially, electorally. And I think they'll just get tired of losing. I mean, there's, there's a way in which that's going to be a hard slap to the face. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of the real difficulty with all this is that there is, with every stage, there's a relatively healthy version of that stage. And then there are various degrees of dysfunctional versions of that stage. And just because you're at a relatively high stage doesn't mean you can't really screw stuff up. You can still have shadow issues. You can still have really massively dysfunctional ideas and options. It just means that you're doing so with more complex kinds of thinking, which also means you can come up with much more complex and idiotic solutions that are even worse than somebody at earlier stages. So that is always a problem with development. We're not just saying it's sweetness and light. You can only do so much damage to the environment or to other people with a bow and arrow. But by the time you get to modern technology, you can gas 6 million people on an assembly line. That's not progress. I mean, it is technologically, but not ethically. So things can still go wrong no matter how quote, high you are in development. And we especially see that in green. Ken, we're nearly an end here. I feel like we're just kind of warming up, but we're in the last couple of minutes here. Someone's asked me to call you a beautiful human animal, which I thought was nice. Um, I'm just loving hearing like the heart and passion, you know, like you're kind of getting on a bit, but you've, you're just this fire in your blood with this stuff. Thank you. Mm. Closing comment, closing thought, anything you want to well, this, uh, I, I'm always delighted, seriously, to see people like everybody on this broadcast who are concerned with these issues, because you wouldn't be concerned with these issues if, if these notions weren't circulating in you somehow. And it's the very fact that you're concerned with this and that you're willing to talk about it and that you're willing to exchange ideas on this, and that you're willing to grapple with these ideas, that if anything's going to save us, it's that kind of discussion, that kind of openness, and that kind of interest. And so I am truly honored to be part of this discussion. And God bless all of you for doing this. This is where the hope lies. Ken. Ken, thank you so much. Subscribe to get more. And you can also leave us a review on iTunes, which helps with our rankings. So really appreciate that. Um, equally, if you want to support the podcast even more, then fund us. Um, go to Patreon. Give us a dollar per episode. Um, those who don't know, Patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world. I know like so much is available for free now. And, you know, what I'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast. Um, I put it out there for free so everyone can get it. You know, more than I work on this. Everyone that wants it can have it for free. Uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. Uh, and of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.